If you imagine landing at Venice from the sea, as did those who came inland by ship, the first thing you see rising out of the water is the unmistakable shape of the Doge's Palace, the city's most famous building. The palace is the most representative symbol of Venice's culture, which, together with the Basilica of San Marco at the back and the Piazza San Marco in the forefront, forms one of the most famous sceneries in the world. For centuries, the Doge's Palace had three fundamental roles as the Doge's residence, the seat of government, and as the Palace of Justice. This was where some of the most important decisions for Venice's and even Europe's destiny were made. Initially, when it was built in the 9th century AD, it was more like a castle than a palace, with four sighting towers and high defensive walls. In fact, it was in a strategic position to control the city, near its sea access. Later, due to a series of fires and subsequent rebuilding, it became what we can see today a splendid example of Venetian Gothic architecture. This imposing building has the one feature typical of Venetian architecture, lightness. Despite its considerable size, the multicolored facade decorations and the splendid perforation of the Gothic loggias, like stone lace, give us an elegant structure that isn't heavy in appearance. There is also a real architectural find compared to most medieval palaces all over Italy. The Doge's palace was built in the opposite way, with the loggias down below and full walls above, whereas buildings like this normally had a huge base to make them easier to defend. In Venice, the state palace had to be an expression of the Republic's special relationship with its citizens, one of trust and absolute loyalty. Venetians consider their government legitimate not by imposition or divine right, like in other Italian medieval cities, but as an expression of the Venetians' will. The portico is already a special place, a masterpiece within an even bigger masterpiece. The 36 stone capitals on their arches are a marvelous example of medieval sculpture and give us a rich repertoire of symbolic figures, vice and virtue, saints, martyrs, knights, trades, birds, and signs of the zodiac. From these arches, the doge watched public executions in the square, and under the ninth arch, the one that stands out for the red of its marble, death sentences were announced. The palace entrance was through the monumental charter door. At the top, in the main sculpture, you see the ever-present symbol of Venice, the winged lion, with the doge kneeling in front of it. This palace was a highly functional building, and each element had a precise purpose. Starting with the giant staircase in the courtyard, so-called because of two huge statues of Mars and Neptune at the top, symbolizing the Republic's authority over land and sea, is the work of Sansovino. It was here that the Doge's crowning took place, celebrated with great pomp. Climbing to the top, the Doge received the Doge's horn and pronounced the promissione, the promise, to defend and respect the Serenissima's constitution forever. The Doge's apartment only occupies one of the palace's three floors, and to get to it, you climb the beautiful golden stairway, begun halfway through the 16th century by Sansovino. The stairway owes its name to the spectacular golden stucco decorated vault and was formerly only used by magistrates and important people. Today, this apartment has no furnishings as they were partly stolen by Napoleon's army, but it is still a kind of precious casket with masterpieces painted on its ceilings and magnificent stone fireplaces. It gives us an idea of the Doge's lifestyle and of the atmosphere that reigned in these rooms for centuries. On the second noble floor, you find the meeting rooms used by the highest state authorities. But how was the Venetian Republic organized? At a time when the feudal model dominated in Europe and most of the population lived in extreme poverty, in Venice, an enterprising community of merchants, craftsmen and bankers had created a surprisingly modern, advanced republic. The government structure was a pyramid with the People's Assembly at its base and the Doge at the top. These rooms hold some of the most important Venetian art masterpieces. The Council Hall held anything that could amaze people on entering, such as works by Veronese, Campagna, and Tintoretto. 
But we mustn't think that these works were just for the rooms where they could be seen by foreigners. We find the same pomp in the private chambers, those used by government bodies, for example, in the Senate Hall. Here, they made foreign policy decisions, such as appointing new ambassadors. However, it is in the famous Higher Council Hall, where up to 2,000 members of the aristocracy met, that the Republic showed all of its magnificence. This is an impressive hall, monumental in size. Here, all the Republic's power and glory was on show, not only because of its incredible size, but also for the inestimable value of its wall and ceiling decorations. We can just imagine the amazement the room excited in all those setting foot in it, and this was the purpose for which it was designed. Rebuilt after the terrible 1577 fire, as a result of which the Doge Sebastiano Venier died of heartbreak, this hall was literally covered in sumptuous decoration. Veronese contributed with a splendid deification of Venice, and on the ceiling there are works by Bassano, Palma the Younger, but mainly Tintoretto, author of the immense Paradise. It is the largest oil painting in the world, a work started when Tintoretto was older and then finished by his son Domenico. It is a work in which you see the artist's typical mystic light. On three sides of the hall, just under the ceiling's gilt decorations, there are the 76 portraits of the doges, from the 9th, Obelerio, to the 81st, Francesco Venier, work of Tintoretto. They sum up the history of Venice, including the tale of Marin Faliero, the doge accused of high treason, whose portrait is covered by a black cloth. The Doge's palace was also where justice was administered and where the city's terrible prisons were to be found. It wasn't that difficult to end up in jail in Venice. At times, a single anonymous accusation was enough to be arrested, slipped into the mouth for secret accusations still visible in the Hall of the Compass. The last degree of justice was exercised by the most feared tribunal, the Council of Ten. This commission had exceptional powers, and met in absolute secrecy in what is known as the Hall of the Council of Ten. Here, during a trial, no one could enter, not even the accused. The trial took place by reading statements from both the defense and the accused, and decisions were made by a vote that had to be an 80% majority. Arrest could be very traumatic, at times sudden and unexpected. Once in the palace, you could end up either in the ground floor cells, the pozzi, which were more terrible and inhospitable, or up in the garret for the high ranking, the famous piombi, which owe its name to the lead sheeting covering the roofs. Alternatively, prisoners were taken to the new prisons over the famous Bridge of Sighs, named after the sighs of the prisoners barely dragging themselves through the corridor. Once you were in there, life certainly was not easy. The cells were small and damp, cold in winter and hot in summer. Once inside, the prisoner had to share the little space available with dozens of other prisoners, reduced to misery by the bullying of the guards and the poor sanitary conditions. The palace prisons were famous for being difficult to escape. However, someone did manage to demonstrate the contrary. As the day dawned on July 26, 1755, as the third bell rang, Messer Grande entered and told me he had to put me up in the Piombi. These are the words of Giacomo Casanova, romantic hero and famous adventurer whose exploits were talked about all over the world and whose fame is inextricably linked to his legendary escape from the Venice Piombi. Casanova was a man with special gifts, a legendary seducer, but also amateur scholar, actor, and for a short period, even Abbott. When they put him in the Piombi, he was 29 and had already traveled the world. But it was only after his escape that his destiny turned to fame and riches. His memoirs, entitled The Story of My Escape from the Piombi, were printed in 1788 and soon became the equivalent of a modern bestseller. Casanova left the Piombi on the night between 31st of October and November 1st, 1756. Digging up the wooden planks with a makeshift tool, he climbed out of his cell onto the roof 
and then down into an attic. Crossing the entire palace, he reached the golden staircase, where he was seen by a guard who mistook him for a politician who'd been locked in and let him out. A legend says that he stopped for a coffee in San Marco Square before fleeing by sea on a gondola. The Doge's palace is unique. It is more monumental than any public building, and even more precious than a princely residence. It still preserves the charm of one of the most splendid buildings ever built, around which were born the myths that make Venice and its long-lasting government so great. iPod guides are Compart Multimedia copyright. More information from ItalyGuides.it.